well, now we're ready to make a classic pastry crust. And this is a wonderful all-purpose crust that's suitable for all forms of pies. It's flaky, it's tender, and it's got great buttery flavor. Now, most important thing when I start out is making sure that I have the right equipment. I have here a rolling pin that's in beautiful shape. It's got nothing on it. I'm going to lightly flour that so that it's ready to go on my dough when I'm rolling it out. And I've got a nice cold cutting board. Now this marble board here has been in the refrigerator. We'll talk more about temperature in a while, but as long as I keep everything cold, I'm gonna have a lot more success with my final product. Now, as far as my ingredients are concerned, I'm starting with flour, and this is all-purpose flour. All-purpose flour has just enough protein in it to prevent large amounts of gluten from forming. That's the gluey, starchy substance that can result from overmixing or not enough protein in my flour. And to that, I'm going to add a little bit of this salt to season it. I'm going to mix that very well. I don't want clumps of salt in my flour. And now it's time to add my butter and shortening. Now, a lot of you remember in grandma's house, she preferred to use all lard, but that's fallen out of favor. Now, I prefer butter and shortening in a mixture. The butter for flavor, promoting browning, and the shortening, of course, because it has 10% gas in it or air, makes nice flaky layers between my pastry. Now, additionally, the shortening melts at a higher temperature. And that's why it's able to leave those nice, flaky, tender deposits behind as the crust cooks. So I'm just going to add this into my flour and begin to work it with my fingers. Now, some people like to use a pastry cutter like this to break that up. I like to use my hand. I think it's the best tool that you have in the kitchen. And what I'm looking for here is something that resembles crumbled peas, small little beads of texture. I want to get most of that flour absorbed into my butter and shortening before I add my liquid, which in this case is water. Now I'm trying to work quickly and efficiently because the more that I work my flour and shortening and butter, the more gluten is going to form and the warmer this is going to get. And I don't want that. I want to keep the chill in my butter as much as possible. And you can see here that I've got something that is texturally ready to where I'm going to add just enough water to bind it. You see those nice mealy clumps have formed. So here I have my measured water. I'm going to add almost all of that. I know I'm going to need a lot of it, but not necessarily all of it. Again, just enough to when my dough forms a nice, even ball. And I'm almost there, just a little crumbly. Remember, if this is crumbly in the bowl, it's going to be crumbly when I roll it out. And that's not good for having it hold together. And I can feel here. This is coming together absolutely beautifully. And I'm ready to put this out onto my board. You see the way that dough comes cleanly away from our glass there? And I'm just gonna form this into a nice ball. And I'm gonna cover it in plastic wrap and refrigerate it for at least a half hour. That way the dough can relax, prevents the glutens from forming. It's gonna be a lot easier to roll out. Well, this dough has been refrigerated and so it's ready to roll out. And I'm going to unwrap it. Oh, it's just beautiful. I'm gonna dust it with a little bit of flour here and sprinkle a little bit on my board. I'm going to cut it in half, because remember, this is a double recipe. It's enough for two crusts. Beautiful. I'm going to set this one aside while I work on this one. Take my rolling pin, 
push a little bit of that flour off to the side, and slowly work it from the center out. Working it from the center out helps to prevent additional glutens from forming, and most importantly, allows me to make an evenly shaped crust. That crust is perfect. And now I'm ready to use my offset spatula. Just make sure I don't have any little bits sticking. Very carefully get my hands underneath there and move it onto my sideboard and begin rolling out the other dough. Oh, thanks, Jeannie. Well, now we're ready to make our apple pie. And it's a two crust pie, and I've chosen to use this standard nine inch Pyrex or oven proof glass pan to bake it in. That way, I can see that the bottom crust is gonna be nicely browned. It's a nice little feature. Now, the first thing that I wanna do is measure my crust. And the way I do that is by holding my Pyrex pan over and making sure that I have a nice inch of drape over the sides. That's going to account for not only the lip, but a little extra over the side so I can attach my top crust. And I can see that it's just the right size. Place this down. And I can actually just invert that right in there, sliding that down lifting the edges as I do that. I want this to almost fall into the pan. I don't want to be squeezing down on the middle because that's going to cause it to break. Don't worry about any tiny little cracks or fault lines in the crust. It's the easiest thing to do in the world is just gently press it together with your fingers. In fact, what we were the most concerned about before with the temperature and the sensitivity at the crust is actually at this stage, now going to be our friend and allow the crust to form into the pie. So now we're ready to fill our pie. So we've got our apples tossed in the cinnamon and sugar and allspice, a little bit of nutmeg, a few tablespoons of cornstarch, a little bit of lemon juice. And these are Cortland or Harrelson apples, a good baking apple. Whatever is your favorite is easy enough to use for you, go ahead and do that. And I'm just gonna start mounding these beautiful apples into my pie. Now there are lots of angles and edges here. I don't worry about that right now. I don't need them to all rest flat. What I do wanna make sure is I don't have any pockets where it's going to settle and leave one side of my pie higher than another. So I arrange them just like so. Let me put another one right there. And now I'm ready to lay my top crust over this pie. Now the most important part of this operation is brushing the edge of that dough with some water. I'm gonna take some water there and I'm gonna make the first dab in my hand so I get all the big puddle there in my hand and on the crust because if we put too much water on this crust, it's gonna turn way too soft awful quick. So I make sure to get all that excess water off in my hand. This water is just to help it act like glue. Again, I'm not gonna worry too much about placement of that because I'm gonna be able to cut off that excess dough. And here is my other crust. And all I'm going to do is lay this right on top of there like so. Now, I'm actually going to adhere this very gently. I'm not going to make any marks and I'm gonna make sure not to push down too heavily because I don't want any of my pieces of apple to come up through the pie crust. And I'm gonna get a chance to cut and crimp this in just a second. So again, I just wanna make sure that that's nice and attached. And it is. Now it's time to clean it up. I'm gonna use this small paring knife and what I'm going to do is I'm gonna let the side 
of the pie shell help me form that edge. I am pressing my knife against the edge of that Pyrex pan so that I get a beautiful, you see that? Nice straight edge. Anyone can do that because the, as long as my pie pan is straight, I'm gonna get a straight edge. Just turn that around. Again, just a gentle up and down motion. Make sure to turn your crust. There, now, these little bits don't belong in the garbage. What I love to do with these, just like my grandma did, brush them with butter, sprinkle them with a little bit of cinnamon sugar and bake them off for the kids in the house to eat or maybe some of the older kids. That way they're not gonna be nibbling away at the crust. So I'm gonna put that over here, save that for later. Now, before I cut some slits in this so the steam has a chance to vent. And before I brush it with a little bit of egg wash for shine and sprinkle it with a little bit of sugar, I'm going to want to crimp the edges. Now I could use a fancy fluting instrument. I could use a fork and make some very rustic tine marks around the outside. But I think for this, I'm gonna use the good old classic pinch and thumb method. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to use my left hand, I'm a righty, I'm gonna place that there like a little marker and I'm going to use my thumb and make little chevrons equally distant from each other around the outside of this pan. And all I'm doing is sort of pressing straight down onto the lip of that Pyrex pan, letting it do the work for me. So you can see here, this is another occasion that I have to make sure the top and the bottom of this pie crust adhere to each other. Oh, there's a little bit of apple poking in. Don't let that disturb you. Just skip over a part there if you see a piece of apple poking through. If you try and manipulate it too much, the dough is gonna tear. Remember, as it warms up, it's going to become more and more pliable, and we don't wanna tear it. We have this beautiful top crust here. See, there's another piece of apple. I'm just gonna skip over that there. Absolutely perfect. Now, very last thing that I want to do, second to last really, brush some egg white here. And I'm going to start with the crust here and then work my way towards the middle from the edges of that crust. Beautiful. Now that pie is ready for the oven. Now, to ensure that my crust browns properly and that my apples cook all the way through and that this pie turns out just as perfect as it looks, I'm going to start this for about 20 minutes at 400 degrees, and then turn the heat down to 350 and cook it for another 40, 50, maybe even 60 minutes, but that way it won't brown too quickly. 